Hey, how's it going? So you've probably seen the iceberg format done to death, and I won't waste any time describing it. But basically what I've put together here is a pharmacology iceberg, spanning the pharmacology of some well-known drugs like amphetamines, all the way to some pretty obscure and wacky compounds. I just want to preface this and say that my main focus is pharmacology, so while there are several drugs of abuse on this iceberg, they're only here because I find them interesting in some way or another relating to their pharmacology. And usually for me to find something interesting, it has to have some sort of clinical potential. So you'll see that bias reflected in the compounds I choose to talk about here. No shade towards anyone who looks at these compounds in a different way. I actually don't really have strong opinions one way or the other when it comes to recreational drug use. Although I kind of do have to acknowledge it with some of the stuff I put on this list. So yeah, basically don't take this as like a tier list of recreational drugs. Because to be honest, I'm like the worst person to ask about this. And you might be able to find that elsewhere instead. I've also noticed that these videos tend to have a unnecessarily forced creepy feel. I'll probably have like some creepy ambience playing in the background, but just know it's like usually not that deep. The drugs included in level 1 are essentially those which are well known to society. Aside from their mechanisms of action being rather misunderstood by the public, namely that certain drugs like methamphetamine and fentanyl do not appear to be uniquely toxic at equipotent doses relative to comparable drugs that are commonly regarded as therapeutic, there isn't actually much atypical about how these drugs work. But it's worth noting that the hallucinogens psilocybin and LSD share a common target receptor, known as the serotonin 2 a receptor, a receptor demonstrated to be required for the psychedelic hallucinatory effect. MDMA actually stands for methylene dioxymethamphetamine, exhibiting the typical amphetamine characteristic of releasing monoamines, but exhibiting a substantial bias towards the release of serotonin over that of dopamine and noradrenaline. And while caffeine is commonly conceptualized as an antagonist to adenosine receptors, there's actually some evidence to suggest that it might be an inverse agonist, essentially evoking the opposite response of adenosine at the receptor, which may better explain its high ceiling effects in overdose than the popular explanation that it disguises tiredness. Alright, there's not much more I can say here, so let's move on to the next level. Drugs at this level are not very well known by the general population, but are very well known among certain in communities, but not exclusively recreational drug users, as many drugs included at this level are very familiar to individuals who have or are actively undergoing psychiatric treatment for a variety of conditions like insomnia, depression, and schizophrenia. However, due to the nature of drug scheduling laws in the United States, there exist many obscure chemicals, some of which are former pharmaceuticals, that are not known to major authorities and are thus unregulated and sought after as legal highs. The classical hallucinogen DMT is included at this level, as popular awareness of this drug is not to the level of its cousins DMT and psilocybin. DMT has an interesting property of being incredibly short-lasting when not administered with an MAOI, as it possesses a biological half-life of mere minutes. Interestingly, DMT has been found, which have spurred on some pretty fringe theories about its role in human cognition. However, given a lack of evidence and its chemical similarity to serotonin, there isn't much to support it being anything but a metabolic fluke. I am always surprised to hear DMT talked about in this way, as there is another drug that is produced in the brain that actually has its own dedicated receptor and a better case for an influence on human cognition, being gamma-hydroxybutyrate or GHB. With the newly characterized GHB receptor actually being excitatory, in spite of its sedative effects at high doses which are attributed to its agonism of GABA-B. Insomniacs will be very familiar with drugs of the Z class like Zolpidem and Zopoclone, which function as selective agonists of the benzodiazepine site on GABA-A receptors containing the alpha-1 subunit. Because alpha-1 containing GABA-A receptors are more implicated in sedation rather than anxiety, these drugs have a more selective sedative action and possess comparatively less potent anticonvulsant and anxiolytic effects relative to traditional benzodiazepines. One such Z-drug, Zolpidem or Ambien, has gained a reputation for its disinhibiting effects, with individuals driving, having intercourse, and even one case of a racist tweet while under the influence of the drug. However, at one point its maker, Sanofi, had to step in and clarify that racism is not a known side effect of the medication, although it is important to note that the actual rate of behavior 
behavioral side effects is less than 3% in clinical trials, and it's likely that these reports, while legitimate, represent only a small patient population that may be especially susceptible to the drug's effects. Well known to the nootropics community is paracetam, the prototypical and original nootropic, with the term being coined to describe paracetam's elusive mechanism of action, especially for the 1960s, where it was not observed to directly interact with any receptors in the brain, yet was still able to protect against the cognition impairing effects of drugs that did, as well as purportedly improve whole brain metabolism and resistance to hypoxia. It is still used clinically to this day in many Eastern European countries, although its efficacy in enhancing cognition in mild cognitive states is rather disappointing. Dextromethorphan, or DXM for short, is pharmacologically a very promiscuous drug. It has a reputation as a legal high, and at one point the FDA even considered removing it from shelves, but the therapeutic value of DXM was deemed to be too great relative to the extent of its recreational use and potential harms. The drug's pharmacology is rather complex, acting as a mixed NMDA receptor antagonist, SRI, NRI, and an agonist of mu opioid and sigma receptors, as well as an additional set of actions bestowed by its active metabolite dextorphan, a comparatively much stronger NMDA receptor antagonist. Interestingly enough, the drug is actually approved as an antidepressant in conjunction with bupropion, where bupropion dramatically increases the serum concentrations of DXM by inhibiting its metabolism to dextorphan. Fun fact, its level isomer is actually a much more potent opioid, and unlike many other drugs of the morphinon class, like morphine, DXM's opioid affinity is rather low. Another so-called nootropic is phenibut, a phenylated derivative of the neurotransmitter GABA. Developed in Soviet Russia in the 1960s and later licensed for use in many Soviet countries for a variety of psychiatric conditions, not limited to insomnia, anxiety, ADHD, Tourette's and vertigo among others. Whether phenibut is actually a particularly efficacious drug at treating any of these conditions is unknown, as most of the associated clinical trials are only available as abstracts in western databases. Regardless, Phenibut's pharmacology is unique even by modern standards, being a mixed GABA-B and VGCC channel blocker, with the GABA-B receptor being undiscovered at the time of Phenibut's invention. In fact, the modern GABA-B agonist Baclofen is a chlorinated derivative of Phenibut. In the Russian literature, the drug was described as being void of cognitively impairing side effects, even being described as cognition enhancing especially in relation to the newly discovered benzodiazepines of the time. The drug has unsurprisingly been picked up by certain recreational communities who seem to use the drug at super therapeutic doses in excess of three times the maximum recommended daily dosage in Russia. To avoid spending too much time here, I'm going to rapid fire some other facts about compounds at this level. Like that the opioid tramadol was once thought to be naturally occurring, being discovered in the African peach at one point. In reality, what had occurred is that farmers were feeding their cattle tramadol, which was then excreted into the ecosystem and showed up in these plants. Muscimol is an active drug found in perhaps the most beautiful mushroom on earth, Amanita muscaria and acts as a direct agonist of GABA-A receptors. Its prodrug ipotenic acid has been characterized as a neurotoxin. Tianeptine is an atypical opioid antidepressant that for unknown reasons at low doses seems to provide antidepressant effects, yet at higher doses it becomes more like a traditional opioid and has thus been sought after as a legal high. Through its actions on the mu opioid receptor, it seems to modulate glutamatergic transmission in a way that prevents or attenuates the neurobiological effects of stress. And finally, modafinil is a wakefulness-biased psychostimulant that has a history of being used to stave off sleep deprivation in certain high-stakes professions, such as astronauts and military pilots with two studies showing that it was able to dramatically attenuate the cognition impairing effects of over 60 hours of sleep deprivation. Compared to more traditional psychostimulants like amphetamine, modafinil appears to modulate brain waves as assessed by encephalography in a way that more readily corresponds to normal wakefulness and does not produce rebound hypersomnia relative to placebo. Alright, on to the next level. The third level of this iceberg includes only a few drugs used in clinical practice, instead being primarily occupied by research chemicals and discontinued drugs. A variety of individuals may know about the drugs at this level, 
but there is very little commonality between them, ranging from some pretty irresponsible lab rats to individuals trying to self-medicate their treatment-resistant conditions, or pharmacology nerds who ran out of things to read about on Wikipedia. Pemeline is a discontinued drug that was once used to treat ADHD in the United States. The drug had little to no sympathomimetic effects due to its selectivity for dopamine reuptake inhibition and release, while minimally affecting noradrenergic tone. However, due to a handful of cases of liver failure that proved unpredictable and rapid, resulting in pediatric deaths, the drug was withdrawn from the market, leaving only a methylphenidate and amphetamine as the only two stimulant options for ADHD to this day. Gaboxidol is a confirmationally constrained derivative of muscimol. It behaves as a super agonist at the delta-containing GABA-A receptor, meaning that it evokes a response that is greater than the endogenous agonist GABA. Also of note is that this receptor is insensitive to benzodiazepines, which may explain Giboxidol's differential effects on neurotransmission and behavior. There were several attempts to commercialize the drug for a variety of conditions, ranging from Parkinson's, insomnia, and even depression. It actually showed quite a bit of promise in insomnia, having little withdrawal even after two weeks of dosing when compared to Zolpidem, and improving sleep quality to a similar degree. Xenon is a noble gas and general anesthetic that acts as a competitive antagonist of the glycine site on the NMDA receptor. Unlike high doses of other NMDA receptor antagonists, the drug has been observed to be comparatively less neurotoxic even inhibiting the neurotoxic effects of high doses of ketamine and nitrous oxide, while releasing comparatively less dopamine in nucleus accumbens, the main action implicated in drug-induced euphoria. It's a lesser-known anesthetic that I find pretty interesting, so I thought it deserved a place at this level. Agomelatine is a melatonin-based antidepressant, bearing a copycat similarity to melatonin in its chemical structure. However, in addition to agonist activity at melatonin 1 and 2 receptors, the drug is also a weak antagonist to the 5-HT2C receptor, with antagonism of this receptor disinhibiting the release of dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. Its antidepressant effects have been distinguished from melatonin in preclinical models, although it has never been directly compared to melatonin in humans. In a Lancet meta-analysis of over 22 different antidepressants, it was one of two antidepressants to be more tolerable than placebo. Salvinorum A is a non-alkaloid plant compound present in the salvia divinorum plant. Aside from some minor activity at dopamine 2 receptors, the drug is incredibly selective as a kappa opioid agonist, with the kappa opioid receptor being a uniquely dysphoric receptor that functions as a break to dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, yet still produces pain relief like traditional opioids. I kind of have to acknowledge the elephant in the room here and say that the drug has been characterized recreationally, big quotation marks here, as a ridiculously immersive deliriant, with some individuals reporting that they were transported beyond space and time and supposedly spending eternities as an object. Yeah, there's not much more I can say here. Ibogaine is an alkaloid from the African plant Tabernanta iboga. The drug has been used for at least a few hundred years in what is now modern-day Gabon, but has only recently been explored for its anti-addictive properties. With extracts of the plant appearing to attenuate opioid withdrawal in addicts, acting as a kappa opioid and nicotinic agonist, in addition to a variety of other actions as well as those bestowed by its active metabolite nor ibogaine. The drug is rather cardiotoxic, sometimes leading to extreme adverse effects during administration, which has limited its use as a treatment for addiction, but has served as an inspirational scaffold of sorts for another drug we will discuss later. Zaloplon is a lesser known drug of the Z class. Like Zolpidem and Zopiclone, it acts as a selective agonist of the alpha-1 containing subunit of the GABA-A receptor, potentiating GABA at this receptor by binding to the benzodiazepine site. However, its fast pharmacokinetics are what distinguish it from other Z drugs, having a half-life of only one hour and reaching peak concentrations in that same time frame. For this reason, the drug is only really useful for sleep initiation rather than sleep maintenance. However, this rapid clearance permits individuals to be at normal cognitive function in as little as two hours after initially administering the drug. This has given it a special exemption on the no-go list of the US Air Force, and whereas the flight restriction with Zolpidem is six hours, it is only four hours for Zaloplon.
Okay, as you can tell, there's a lot more to get through here, but I'm gonna have to cut this video short, partially because I'm a student and I don't have much time to work on this, but also because I want to determine where I should allocate my time in making videos. So if this gets enough interest, I would definitely make another one where I cover the last three levels and every other compound that I missed in the upper levels. But in the meantime, you can check out other videos on my YouTube and TikTok, many of which are dedicated to compounds on this list, provided you haven't gotten sick of my rambles already. Okay, let me know what you think down below and stay safe with your research. Bye.